my name is Rinka Stahuliak. I'm a professor in, uh, of French and comparative literature here at UCLA and the director of the Center for Early Global Studies. And it is my great pleasure to welcome you to the final event of this year's New Book Salon series, which is a series that we actually started during the pandemic. Uh, it, the idea was to provide an intimate setting as, one, as much as one could have an intimate setting online, but to have an intimate setting in which to feature recent books by our UCLA faculty or by our associates, that, that is the associates of the center. Um, and it was actually one of the many initiatives we started that year as literally um, the world was changing around us, but it was also a good time to actually change the center a little bit. So that was one of the formats we tried, but certainly the most important thing we did during the pandemic is that we changed the name of the center. We used to be Center for Medieval and Renaissance Studies for 58 years of our existence as we were founded in 1963. And then we became in September 2021 Center for Early Global Studies. So I am, of course, hoping that we will have another 60 years in our future. <laughs> yeah, we'll see. But um, anyway, but today um, we are to present, as I said, the last of this year's um, new book salons. We try to do one a quarter. And I am very pleased that Jonah Drucker um, has accepted the invitation to do this one on her latest book. And she is the Breslauer Professor of Bibliographical Studies in the Department of Information Studies here at UCLA. She is internationally known for her work in artist books, the history of graphic design, typography, experimental poetry, fine art, and digital humanities. And in fact, also on her interest and work on manuscripts and rare books. And she has been a member of our History of the Book Committee for many years. So thank you, Joanna, for that too. Recent titles um, her, of, her, of her books are Graphesis, Visual Forms of Knowledge Production, The General Theory of Social Relativity, Downdrift, an Echo Fiction, Visualization, Modeling Interpretation, and Digital Humanities Coursebook. And this is really just a selection. In, two, in 2014, she was elected to the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, and her work has been translated into many languages, so many that I decided not to mention them all, but many. Her latest book and the focus of today's New Book Salon is Inventing the Alphabet, the Origins of Letters from Antiquity to the Present, came out from Chicago in 2022. <laughs> She, she will be in conversation with Helen Deutsch, who teaches in the UCLA English department and works at the crossroads of 18th century studies and disability studies, with particular emphasis on questions of authorship, originality, and embodiment across a variety of genres. Her ongoing research questions include the relation of 18th century authors to classical models, the multifaceted connection between physical embodiment and literary form, the interplay between visual and printed cults of authorship and the phenomenon of author love more broadly considered, and also the form formative relationship between bodily difference and modern individuality. Now, she is working on a very important to her, but I think also a very important book project for all of us, and that is on the literary afterlife of Jonathan Swift, best exemplified by one of his most passionate readers, Edward Said. So we will look forward to that and maybe having you do a new book salon. Oh, I love it. That would be wonderful. But I uh, thank all the audience online and the audience here in the room uh, to have joined us today. And I leave the podium to Joanna and Helen. Thank you both. Yes. Thank you, Zrinka. Um, so we, I am going to be holding this microphone throughout and Joanna is, has her little a a secret secret microphone. Mic. <laughs> um, and which you can see. I first just want to thank you, Joanna, for asking me to have this conversation with you. And you can all see I have many notes because Joanna, I know very well from her work um, and devotion to the Center for 17th and 18th Century Studies in the Clark Library, where she has been very active, both as a you know, guiding scholarly presence and a teacher. Um, and I've always, I, when I first met her and heard that she was coming, I knew she had a degree in écriture, and I was like, who is this person? And over the years, as I've learned about how multifaceted um, her career is and just how staggeringly productive she is and how <laughs> incredibly lucky we are to have her with us, um, I 
just welcomed this opportunity to read this book. And when Joanna asked me to do this, she said that this was her magnum opus. <laughs> so I, my first question is a little bit of a blurb for you also. And you can see I have notes, right? I'm gonna talk for my notes. <laughs> so um, I wanna ask about that PhD in Ecrator and then the book, The Alphabetic Labyrinth mm -hmm. that you wrote, that you published in 1995, which um, when Joanna published that, she was working uh, in the Department of Art History at Yale, although she is not an art historian, as we were discussing. Discussing. <laughs> Wonder about that. We were having quite the conversation. Um, and that book really revels in the visual history of the alphabet and thinks about all the different ways in which the alphabet and letters have been assigned all kinds of different value, political, spiritual, and religious value uh, across the centuries. Um, but you know, you work in so many other fields, as Srenka's introduction just was saying, including experimental poetry, fine art, digital humanities. And you're also known, of course, for your artist books. And I really enjoyed thinking about, reading about that traveling retrospective, which I wish I could have seen, Drop Works, that you did, which was 40 years of books and projects that Joanna has done. So I know that inventing the alphabet moves from the what, which the 95 book was more about, to the how of the alphabet. But how do we know what we know about the alphabet? And how do we know what we know about it? So my question is another how, which is how does this book bring together all these different aspects um, of your career? I know you're going to keep writing, but still. <laughs> Um, well, thanks. Uh, first of all, thanks for for doing your homework. And I, I, it's not I a ruined this book. It, yeah, um, acts of book terrible violence by scholars um, <laughs> are a topic for a future study. Um, but um, the the PhD in Ecriture, which I got at UC Berkeley, um, was a loophole that was open at that time, where if you wanted to do an ad hoc interdisciplinary PhD, and you could get five faculty to agree to the program, you could put together something if it didn't exist. And when I got to the university in 1980, um, I had already been out of school for eight years. I was involved with a poetry scene and writers and literary work and letterpress work and design and book arts. And, um, you know, I got to the university and I wanted to study um, the history of writing. And it wasn't a field anywhere. No, nobody studied the history of writing in the university. They still don't. There's people who do paleography and, you know, really, you, you know, in-depth sort of study of, of paleography or the use of writing or in medieval, you know, hands and so forth. But the idea that the university wouldn't exist without writing but then no one studied it in a systematic way was baffling to me. And um, at the time there was, I, I, the linguistics, so I didn't even know what linguistics was to be honest I, when I got to the university, but I went over to the linguistics department and it was the time of Chomsky, right? So mm -hmm. everything was deep structures, surface structure transformations, which I was like, these people are totally whacked out, you know? So, mm -hmm. but, um, but I went, I met this wonderful senior scholar, Yaakov Malkiel, who was again, very kind of old school. She taught a wonderful class on the history of linguistics. And so that was really fascinating to me. And I went to speak with him and he said, if you wanna study the history of writing as a visual form, it will be a lonely life. He hmm. said, because there isn't any, anybody else doing it. But it was also the time that Derrida, Jacques Derrida's work on um, you know, writing had, had really taken over the, you know, had a huge impact on theory. And Derrida, of course, was not interested in the material instantiation of writing, but a kind of critical theoretical stance about écriture as différence, as, you know, sort of, he had a pushback against orality that was very important and significant. And so I took my, my title from, you know, my, mm -hmm. the title of my PhD um, from Derrida's work, um, and, uh, and I put together this three-part PhD on the history of writing, series of visual representation, and um, you know the uh, and and uh, yeah, history of writing, series of visual uh, representation, and um, yeah, and and it just you know studies of writing in in general, and uh, oh theory, yeah, semiotic structuralism, post, you mm -hmm. know, it was, it was heavy theory time. 
So constructing a theory for you know writing as a form of representation with its various semiotic dimensions and material dimensions mm -hmm. became my passion. But this book, uh, um, this book, show my copy, which is not defaced. Yes. Um, <laughs> uh, it began really in 1980 because I walked into Doe Library at UC Berkeley, which is a fantastic research library. You know, it's like there's nothing better than open stacks in an incredible research library. Open stacks and good catalog records are the key to research. <laughs> <laughs> my colleague, my colleague Neil knows what I'm referring to at the moment. Um, but um, you know, walking into the library, and at that point, I came across a book. And actually, uh, T, if you want to, you can flip through a couple slides, and I'll tell you where to stop. Um, and because uh, I keep going, it's, yeah, just go, go, go. We may or may not come back to some of these things. Go, 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 go. Gives you a sense of what the book is like, too. Go, 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 go. go 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 yeah we can come back go 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 i hope i didn't get rid of it oh i did what how can i do that i think i know the image you're talking about yeah okay so it's an image by uh in a book by baron von helmont uh who was a buddy of leibniz's and happened to find himself in jail yes uh, for heretical beliefs. His father was an, here, I can stand up and, and show you this. His father was an alchemist. Um, and, uh, and, and young Van Helmont um, had various kinds of heretical beliefs. Now, just check this image out, right? Um, I find this book on the open stacks in, in Doe Library. And it's this tiny vellum bound book, right? I mean, little. Um, like the size of a, of a cell phone, right? And this book was printed in 1667. Mm -hmm. And I take this thing off the shelf. And I just can't believe it. I cannot believe it, right? I'm look, I open this thing up and I go, what, what is this, right? Like what is going on with like cutting this person's head open? And what, yeah. what's with these letter forms? And these look like they're made out of Play-Doh or Play-Doo-Doo. And you know, <laughs> here's this crown and it's got letter forms in it. And I'm like, what? what you know what is this and it's called the you know the the true alphabet of nature the hebrew alphabet of nature and i'm like okay i gotta know what this thing is i have to understand this this image and um and the frontest piece of this shows van helmont sitting in his jail cell with a mirror and a candle and he's looking at his tongue and teeth and organs of articulation and drawing them imagining his own head sliced open, no doubt. <laughs> and, um, and, and, and then he has this idea that the position of the tongue, the glottis, the esophagus is actually what gives rise to the shape of the Paleo-Hebrew letters, which are called Chaldean. And I'm like, what is Chaldean? Where, where's Chaldea? Mm -hmm. What, you know, my biblical education having been a little, mm, let's just say, scanty <laughs> and um so you know it's like what is this thing it was this incredible mystery and um being a little philistine i took that vellum bound beautiful thing with its engravings and i took it to the xerox machine and put that <laughs> copy on the xerox machine and copied it i know exactly see crimes against books yep. is the real theme of today's yep. talk yeah okay. yeah yep. so um and and it it did take me almost 40 years to, to kind of work all of that out. Um, where did he find these letter forms? What, what were these paleo Hebrew letter forms that he has in this crown in 1667? What, what are the sources for these? How are they transmitted? What are the, you know, um, you know, sort of letter forms with the ringlets on the end? What, what, what's the, what's the, the method of transmission of all of these things? So that was the start point. So, you know, my alphabet studies were an important part of my grad work, but I ultimately did a dissertation on a modern topic because my advisor did say, you are going to want a job. Right. <laughs> And that, that certainly all worked out very well for you. It worked out. <laughs> and just so everybody knows, we overlapped at Berkeley, which we just learned today for a period of years, but we didn't know each other there. And I remember finding 
first editions of like Dryden's, yeah. all the translations with yellow highlighter yeah. on them in, oh. in the stacks of Joe Library. So it made me happy though, to think of um, Johanna in those stacks. So I have all kinds of questions about the visual and material nature of letters, but I wanna maybe move um, to the idea of inventing the alphabet. And you say, you, your first chapter is called, How Did the Alphabet Become Greek? And there is a whole strain um, story in this book of all the different ways in which the ancients knew something true about the alphabet, which is that it, or it, it originated in Afro-Asiatic exchange, that it was inherently related to Semitic speakers, Semitic writers. And then this gets kind of forgotten or erased or rewritten for all kinds of complex motivations. So you say it was invented only once by Semitic speakers of the ancient Near East and that the common root of all alphabets emerged nearly 4,000 years ago in a cultural exchange between Egyptians, Canaanites, and other speakers of the, of the Afro-Asiatic language group of which Semitic languages form a branch. And then there is, this book is also a story of the invention of a number of disciplines, including archeology, span paleography, I don't know how to pronounce epigraphy. Yeah, you do. Is that it? <laughs> So it's also a story about professionalization and the invention of disciplines and various divisions of knowledge and technologies of knowledge. Um, and that a lot of the archeology span is happening in ancient Syria, Palestine, Lebanon, Jordan, the Levant, Israel, Syria, Western Iraq. So it's invented only once, but the book is called Inventing and Inventing is an ongoing process. So I wonder if you could just talk a little bit about that sense of, on the one hand, so much of the book, I kept thinking about Said in a couple of ways as I was reading. And one is the way he talks about in his book on late style, invention as a kind of coming upon rather, rather than a starting from scratch, invention as a kind of re-encounter with something. Um, and I was also thinking about beginnings, of course, because so much of this book is about the need for origins and that even when we know the answers, there, there are, there's a need for different origins for all kinds of different reasons. So I realize that's a very long question, but there's one invention <laughs> and then a lot of inventing that goes on. Yeah, exactly. So just for those of you who haven't, aren't familiar with the book, the book is a historiography rather than a history. So it really is about you know the ways that we, uh, the, the various intellectual traditions in which the, you know, idea of the origin of the alphabet had, you know, a whole intellectual sort of framework around it. And so there are many different origin stories. Um, and, uh, and it takes, uh, a, a, you know, basically about 2000 years for the technologies of knowledge production to catch up to the kind of, you know, empirical evidence, the forensic evidence of how the alphabet came into being. Um, and so, but many of these traditions are really rich and interesting, and I would argue valid in their own right. And one of the things I'm interested in is the kind of cultural authority of the past. In other words, we have, you know, the, the sense that, you know, the, Van Helmont wasn't wrong. Van Helmont had a vision that was complete into itself about where the letters of the alphabet come from, which was, you know, the articulatory organs. Um, and, uh, but the, the ways in which the concept of inventing works here um, is really a kind of you know, straightforward constructivist approach to knowledge, which is that what we know depends on how we know. And in science and technology studies, this is completely common. Right. Nobody would talk about you know, the history of, of astronomy without talking about, well, what, what could you do with observation? What could you do with telescopes? What can you do with radio telescopes? What can you do with mirror, you know, and the James Webb, you know, signal processing, that all of those things factor into what we know. No, nobody would even blink about it. And I think people in STS would not separate the object of study from the technologies of knowledge production. But in the humanities, we have this, like, we lift everything right out of the technologies. So part of what I was interested in here is how do these different technologies allow us to tell different parts of this history? So for instance, the earliest text we have that actually describes the alphabet, its 
origin and spread is Herodotus' 440 BCE text. Nothing earlier than that exists that's come down to us that actually talks about the, you know, where did the alphabet come from? Herodotus is a Greek historian and he says, guess what? The alphabet came from the East. And he names this figure Cadmus, who's a mythic figure. Mm -hmm. um, but Cadmus is, you know, Cadmus the Phoenician. So the term Phoenician is anachronistic. The Phoenicians didn't use it. They called themselves, you know, from Byblos, from Sidon, from Tyre. And, but the point is, it's a text. And he's describing what he sees. He's describing what's present to him to observe. But there's no images. So we do not know what Herodotus was looking at. We only know that he knew that the alphabet as it came to Greece was 17 or 18 symbols, and that then uh, Palamedes added a couple of letters, and so and so added a couple of letters, because the Greeks, speaking an Indo European language, needed other signs to accurately um, you know, record the sounds of the language that they spoke. But it's a, it, 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 we have no idea what he's looking at. In the middle of the 20th century, a woman named Lillian Jeffrey, who's a fantastic classicist, basically does an inventory of all of the scripts of archaic Greek, of archaic Greece, right? Looking at every extant inscription from the, they don't start from about the 8th century BC, you know, BCE, but 8th, 7th, 6th. And she wants to see, like, what do those letter forms look like? And, you know, as they migrate, because the letter forms are brought around the Mediterranean um, into, you know, the islands of Greece, onto the mainland of Greece, overland, um, from Asia Minor and the multiple routes through which the alphabet forms enter. And so she's looking at these. And so for the first time, you know, we have this full inventory of what these scripts look like because she's got these inscriptions and can copy them and record them and, you know, reproduce them. And so she goes to Herodotus to check her research. It has to match. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And then, you know, as the technologies transform, by the time we're in the Middle Ages, um, we have these, you know, grimoire and these medieval texts where all kinds of, you know, esoteric and angelic and mystic alphabets get recorded. They're never used for texts. Well, they're never used for actual texts, but they're exemplars that get copied and carried on. Ethicus Ister, the mythical eighth century traveler, the, this, you know, tangled tale, um, you know, there's an alphabet attributed to Ethicus Ister, and it gets passed on intact over and over and over again. Though, so as far as I know, there are no texts in, in, in Ister's alphabet. And, you know, so, so these things are fascinating. And, you know, so that the, so the, the visual exemplars um, accumulate, and little by little, people start to want, people start to get physical evidence, coins, Right, mm -hmm, the, mm -hmm. the 18th century is the great era of you know antiquarians who start to have collections, but the coins are far from their original homeland and they're not that old. They're Maccabean, which means they're common era, which means that they are for those of you whose biblical history is even more scanty than mine. Um, you know, the Maccabean uprising was against the Romans, it was Jews trying to overthrow the overlords, and so we have these Maccabean coins. But there's no physical evidence, but what there is, you know, has this kind of older form of, of the Hebrew on it. And then, you know, again, we start to, you know, the, the, the quest to find actual physical evidence of biblical history drives all kinds of research. Mm -hmm. And, you know, because Bernard de Montfacon, one of the great figures of, you know, 18th century um, you know, uh, and uh, antiquarianism, um, actually, 17th century. Anyway, um, this is embarrassing, it but it doesn't <laughs> matter. But the point is, Bernard de Montfacon and his magnificent giant volume called Antiquity Explained. I mean, that's when books were books, <laughs> scholars were scholars. Mm -hmm. And uh, Montfacon goes to every um, scholar who has a cabinet of curiosities. And that he's well connected, you know, this is, you know, his thing and copies everything he can find. And in his introduction to Antiquity Explained, he said, I cannot find physical evidence to support biblical history. And he is really upset by this because he says, without physical evidence, you know, we, we don't, we, we, before you to study the material, or you, you are limited in what you can understand about history. So here's this like, 
materialist, constructivist scholar right, writing this. So, and then uh, there is a moment when we actually get an archaeological discovery in the Levant, in you know the area from which the alphabet actually, you know, spread across the Mediterranean, and that's the 19th century. That's 1855. Right. The first time that there's a monument discovered. So modern archaeology, which at that time is called biblical archaeology, starts to really work with these physical objects and for the first time from you know the site in which they were produced and that means you got to get these paleographers right and you know Semitic paleography becomes a field um and uh it, it's paleography and epigraphy and so forth so these things are successive um and transformative in terms of mm -hmm. what they mm -hmm. bring to the field of alphabet studies um but it is true within alphabet studies i call it, you know that that's field I would identify here, um, no one's ever done this intellectual history. It's, it's never been put together. And people have done parts of it. Um, Martin Bernal, this work I draw on mm -hmm. extensively in parts of the book, um, was a scholar who wrote, uh, he wrote, first of all, Black Athena, right. the Afro-Asiatic roots of, of classical civilization. That got him into a heap of trouble. Um, I remember. That was before people were ready to hear that. Yeah. And it was a really important book. And Cadmian Letters is really a, a study of the ways in which um, the Semitic origins of the alphabet were essentially erased by British classical scholars. Um, everything good was Greek. Yes. Am I, is there something wrong with what I'm doing with this mic? No, it's not It was me. No, no, no. Oh. oh, okay, you're going to lower the, sure. Okay, so we sound like Minnie Mouse. Or something. Our Zoomers. Sure, we okay. sound like chipmunks. That's great. <laughs> Feline metaphors. Okay, I just... I always get anxious around the mic because you can, there's because always pullback the or God knows what else. We're literally long before the week gets. Yeah. They spoke of. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. Oh, now I'm really ruining things. Oh, dear. I'll stop talking about the feline alphabet. <laughs> but, yeah. No. Oh, okay. This is my like break. Yeah, exactly. My, Michael always yells at me for what I do to books. I know it's wrong, but I can't help myself. There is a recovery program. Yeah. <laughs> I also used to write sometimes in books. Yeah, uh, you want us to speak? How's this? Remember, the perfect is the enemy of the good. Okay, no worries, no worries. So on the one hand, I, I, I think what's so wonderful about this book is your generosity toward the past and you're really trying to recover all these aspects of this history that are, um, shall we say, less objective or officially scholarly. Like, I think that there, you clearly love the earlier, the, the material from the earlier chapters. I feel like the book really feels like an artist book during those chapters because these tables and these magnificent, you know, compilations of visual information that are also so ornamental. And some of them are also like, magical that there's this whole Kabbalistic dimension of the alphabet that you're very interested in. I feel like when I read this, I feel like the alphabet still has a lot of magic for you. Um, and there is this poetic dimension to the book that I find very moving. So there's this one way in which it's not a progress narrative that somehow we know more now than we knew then because the ancients were actually right and then things went very wrong. And the Bernal illusion kind of puts us in that. Yeah. Uh, 
direction. But the, the other thing that really struck me is that when we get to archeology, span um, it's not a monumental uh, history at all. One, that's one of the things I really love that these are very mundane often um, fragments that get down there like shards of uh, inscriptions drawn on bricks or on pottery shards that you say at first seem too insignificant to warrant notice. There's like a tremendously important discovery that happens I think in the 90s where it's just graffiti. Like yeah. people are going yeah. for a walk and they are yeah. like, oh, wow, yeah. this looks interesting. And it turns out to be just this huge yeah. groundbreaking revelation. Yeah. And so in a weird way, the monumental part happens earlier with those some of these magnificent volumes that, that I think of as really attempting this monumental synthesis. I think of this book as in some ways monumental, but the archeological part is so humble. Mm -hmm. And I, that just really fascinated. Yeah, no, I mean, it's a really great point because look, the, the monuments of Egypt were visible. You know, I mean, they may have been deserted and, you know, surrounded by sand and, you know, sort of not necessarily understood in terms of what their historical significance was for certain periods of time, but they were visible and they're big, right? The, um, much of the history of uh, Assyria was vanished, right? It was under sand. It had to be unearthed. But when it was unearthed, you got, you know, Azure Bannerpol's library and the palace at Nineveh. I mean, these are magnificent, you know, monuments. You you just look at them and know that the civilizations that built them must have had all kinds of skill and technology and engineering and architecture and geometry and math and and they did. Um, and same with New World monuments, though they're much later when they start to be discovered. These are, you know, you look at the temples in the Yucatan. I mean, you don't have any question that this is from a civilization that was, you know, sophisticated, advanced, and, and well established in its urban centers, its culture, and its knowledge production. So that's not true in the, um, you know, for among uh, Semitic tribes. They're nomadic, they're small. The, the archaeologist uh, Israel Finkelstein has written extensively about this. You know, it's like the kingdom of David, excuse me, you know, mm -hmm. how many tents? Um, you know, and, and that was true. They were nomadic and, um, you know, there, there weren't these urban centers. And so when we think about trying to recover this history, what is there to recover in physical terms, right? There's not going to be these temples. There's not going to be big monumental archways. They don't exist. And um, so one of the quests within, you know, that kind of, uh, you know, hi historic domain was, um, you know, what was the oldest alphabet? Well, it has to have been the alphabet that was given to Moses when he went up on Mount Sinai. All right, because the Decalogue contains all the letters of the Semitic alphabet. And because you know, this is the great moment. Moses goes up on the mountain, comes back down with these written tablets, and this is bringing writing as well as bringing the law. And this causes all kinds of, of confusion for centuries where people are saying, well, wait a minute, how could Moses write if he couldn't read? We can understand that you could read without being able to write, but you can't write. So Moses didn't write the letters, God wrote the letters. Okay, so God gives God Moses these letters. So what letters did he give to, to Moses? Now, as you will recall, again, from your deep biblical education, um, the tablets get smashed when <laughs> Moses comes down because the his people have been bad in his absence. And so he's angry at them for worshiping the golden calf um, with his brother Aaron. And so the tablets get smashed. So the search to find the tablets isn't going to go anywhere, but the search to find the letters that were on the tablet, you know, drives all of that. What is the oldest alphabet? You know, what was the ancient alphabet? So this is another whole set of, of investigations that go on and on and on and into the present in, in, in a certain sense, where the kind of archaeological evidence that gets unearthed in the present gets in, and it is, you know, small shards. There'll, there'll be a little pot shard that has, you know, you know, two or three partial letters on it. And the skill of current epigraphers, people like Benjamin Sass, is that they can look at those letter forms and depending on the slant, the size, the length of a tail of an ancient Hebrew letter, decide where it was made and in what moment and piece together this kind of emergent historiography. 
we have a very small corpus of Semitic inscriptions compared to the giant corpus, for instance, of cuneiform inscriptions. But these mon there were no monuments, there were no buildings with inscriptions on them, they, they don't exist. Um, so it's all very minor, you know, small scale materials. So again, this is really interesting in terms of culture, the significance of this script, um, and the fact that it does come out of this nomadic, you know, sort of mm -hmm. situation and yet becomes this incredible force for, you know, world domination, frankly. Um, there's only one alphabet. This is the other thing. The question's about the alphabet. One alphabet originated once, spread, modified, and is used all throughout the globe in variant forms um, that got modified for different language groups and stylized. So South Asian uh, scripts, Arabic, the North African scripts, Berber, you know, these scripts that go down into Africa. Um, the Vi script is independent, but that's a different story. But Cyrillic, the modified Armenian form, um, you know, again, and we know they're all the same because the sequence of symbols, the names of the letters, and the powers, that is the sounds assigned to them, are the same in all these scripts. So aside from that, the only scripts in use today are character-based scripts, Chinese, Korean, and Japanese, and a few tiny pockets of other things. So it's one, one alphabet, and uh, that undergirds you know, global communications. So think about that, you know, this kind of script invented in the ancient Near East 4,000 years ago. Yeah, it's incredible. And you yeah. end up talking about computer yeah. coding, right? The Unicode, exactly. This big debate in the Unicode community about whether Phoenician and Paleo-Hebrew can be represented in the same Unicode um, structure. No. <laughs> so can, can I ask you more about um, the second half of the book and all the ways in which, um, because there's so much that we know and that you are able to establish that we know about the alphabet. But then there's a lot of forgery, fabrication, oh, yeah. um, fiction of various sorts that detours in different directions. Um, and there's a lot of anti-Semitism in the 20th century that uh, Joanna goes into in really fascinating detail where People would rather think about Sanskrit or they would rather yeah. go in different directions than acknowledge a Semitic origin to the alphabet. And at the end of the book, you basically say, if we were to remove the alphabet from the current environment and all traces of its past, the history of human culture and development would largely vanish. I mean, it really is just yeah. this sort of epic thing yeah. that, that arises from such tiny, um, from such minimal material, um, small material evidence. And so I kept thinking about the famous um, Walter Benjamin statement that every document of civilization is one of barbarism, yeah. thinking about that in, in relation to the alphabet. Um, and at the you have a lot to say about that at the end too, with McLuhan and other people kind of championing alphabet technology in ways that are uh, pretty politically objectionable. So could you just talk more about that part of the book, the kind of political investments in the alphabet and, and um, how that plays out. Sure. Um, well, and again, um, I cite Martin Bernal and, and others in, in, regard, in this regard. Um, and uh, because again, the, the, the ways in which, um, you know, even in the present, there's a kind of desire to say, well, the alphabet that was invented by Semites in the ancient Near East is not really an alphabet. It doesn't become a real alphabet until we get to Greece where we can, you know, annotate the vowels explicitly. Well, Semitic languages are, do not require explicit vowel notation in order to be legible. So setting up a binary in which there's an inadequate and a perfected version, it's already, a, you know, an ideologically loaded value statement. I mean, it's like, hello. Um, so that kind of politics then maps, of course, onto other kinds of, of, of political, you know, activities. But I mean, the other thing to keep in mind is that the, the, the materials that actually are physical forensic evidence of alphabet history can only be discovered in the ancient Near East after the dissolution of the Turkish Empire, the Ottoman Empire, mm -hmm. because that controlled so much of that region and European travelers 
you know, of course, other people that have developed could have, you know, discovered these materials, but it was the Europeans who really wanted to discover their, th this biblical history. It, they were driven by that desire, mm -hmm. um, which was not so much part of the Ottoman Empire, right? right. So, you know, the, yes, the Abrahamic traditions, but not the biblical history. So, so there's the politics of geography as well in terms of access and what can be found. And then there's all kinds of politics around the antiquities when they start to be developed, when they start to be discovered so that, you know, you'll have somebody, you know, discover this, you know, stone that's inscribed and, you know, it's some French, you know, member of the consulate who's passing through says, well, I think that looks interesting. Oh, we should take that one home. And um, now he starts, you know, negotiating with the Bedouin tribes and the Bedouin tribes say, no, 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 this is, you know, important to us, we're gonna keep it. And there's all these things that happen and they, the guy come, the Frenchman comes back uh, the next day and the tribes have decided to pour hot boiling water onto the stone in order to, you know, sort of crack it so that it can't be, you know, removed. Mm -hmm, and, mm -hmm. you know, so, you know, real struggles over, and this is, it's so minimal. Um, I didn't address your other question though, or uh, your point earlier, which was the discovery in the 1990s, which is kind of interesting yes, in terms yes, of the yes, ongoingness. Yes. And maybe after that, we should see if people here yes, have questions. Definitely. Um, but the ongoingness. So again, this establishment of the, of the sense of, you know, we pretty much know that where the alphabet developed and then it's in a cultural exchange between Egyptians and, uh, you know, Assyrians and their language groups, and then a kind of sense of what is writing, what can it do? And, you know, the, the, there's a cuneiform script that actually is phonetic and does analyze the sounds. Um, and, and think about this, the, the intellectual accomplishment of this. You're all native speakers of at least one language. If I were to put you in a room and I were to say, okay, sit down and analyze your language. And when you come up with the basic sounds that are significant and a sign for each one, I'll let you out. Yeah, exactly. Okay, so that would be, <laughs> that would take a while. Um, but the point is that that does happen. Um, and we know pretty much where it happens. And again, it's in Canaan and ancient Canaan and so forth. So, but, uh, and all the physical evidence that we have was from that region. Now there were inscriptions in the Sinai in the rocks of the pathway from Egypt to, um, you know, through the Sinai into the Levant. And these were well known to pilgrims, you know, in uh, certainly in, mentioned in antiquity, but by the 17th century, we have European travelers who are going through that area and looking at the walls of the Sinai, um, you know, uh, valley, the, the pathways and going, yeah, what is that stuff? And, and drawing it um, and recording it and so forth. So there again, it's like, oh, this must be truly the story of, you know, the Jews fleeing from, you know, the, the leaving Egypt and scratching their way, you know, or scratching this information in the rocks. But that's in the Sinai. And the Sinai is connected directly to the Levant. In 1994, the Darnells, John and um, his wife, Deborah, are in, in Egypt in the upper Nile, right, in a in an area on the African continent. This is not the Sinai anymore, on the continent of Africa. And they discover this proto-alphabetic inscription. And as Helen was saying, it just looks like graffiti. You know, I mean, it, it looks like something, because most of the stuff is not very well formed, right? These are not British stone carvers who actually have made a living, you know, making elegant letter forms. The letter forms don't even quite exist. So we see this little scratching and it's proto-alphabetic. We can see the he, hey, you know, we can see the vowel, you know, we see this kind of form. And what is it doing on the continent of, Al of Africa? How can this be here? What is this? And it turns out to be older. It's, you know, at least a hundred to 200 years older than the inscriptions that were at that point considered the oldest, which had come out of, you know, Sarabad al Kadim and on this beautiful little, you know, sandstone sphinx that's in the British Museum, beautiful little thing. And so it's like, what is this? So that was a real interesting yeah. moment because it's like, huh, maybe our geography of mapping this evolution is, is off. Or maybe this was, you know, a Semitic mercenary who was working, you know, for some reason or traveling and just happened to stop by a stone and scratch it, um, you know, with a, you know, sort of prayer, or, you know, notice of 
you know, celebration. So it's just, you know, most of the evidence is gone. It's gone. You know, so you we have have this little bit of what there is to piece things together. Well, this has been really great. And I have many more things I could ask, but I wonder if some of you might have some questions as well or comments for Johanna. You want to see a couple quick pictures? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Why don't you bring up the pictures and I'll just quick, quick kind of caption them and, and have them go through. Yeah. So that you can see them. Um, since we, yeah, it's, uh, uh, can you go back to the beginning? Um, okay. Great. So uh, next. Okay, so this is, uh, oh, this is from Isaac Taylor on the left, one of my great heroes, um, who in 1899 wrote a two volume uh, book called The Alphabet, and he's a fantastic scholar. And he was, you know, trying to show some of the possible relationships between Egyptian hieroglyphics, submit early Semitic forms, um, and their equivalents in Hebrew, uh, what he calls Roman, which is, you know, a, well, we'll, we'll let it be Roman and Greek. So, um, uh, so these are, and here we see a more contemporary. Um, so the, these charts and graphs are another form of technology. Some are very developmental and others are merely comparative. Uh, next. There are many really magnificent ones oh. in the book. Um, this chart is merely to show you how the proto-Canaanite taproot, which is here the Canaanite linear alphabet and proto-Sinatic and so forth around 18, 1700 BCE, gives rise to all of these different um, alphabet forms. And you can see this and there's kind of general dates, but um, you'll see, for instance, the South Arabic script here on the right, 1300 BC, give rise to Ethiopic, Amharic, right? The um, uh, Aramaic comes out of this uh, Phoenician script, this nomenclature is a little antiquated, um, gives rise to Imperial Aramaic, and look, Syriac, Nabataean, Jewish, which becomes modern Hebrew, Arabic, which is quite late, right? It, it actually comes into being around the third century, right? Indian scripts here on the right, Armenian and Georgian. And then if you go on the other side, you see Greek, Etruscan, Latin, Gothic, modern European, Cyrillic and Runic. And then on the far side, you see old Hebrew, Paleo Hebrew, which goes away, but Samaritan preserves a lot of the forms. In Samaritan, there's a Samaritan Pentateuch that gets discovered at a certain moment. And that seems to be the authentic, you know, like earliest, you know. So there's all these debates that go on all the time. Okay, so quick to the next. This is just to show the spread of the alphabet, um, you know, through Asia Minor and into Greece. And the question of really where that transmission took place is still up for debate. It's now believed it probably was on Asia Minor in a Greek colony um, that the um, Greeks learned to use the alphabet because the kind of, you know, passing by of Phoenician traders would not have established a long enough relationship for the alphabet to get adopted for Greek language. Um, so that's just sort of that particular story. Um, next, yeah. Oh, this is a good story. So uh, <laughs> Josephus, the um, Jewish Roman historian, um, in the first, uh, early second century of the common era, writes a story about Seth, um, uh, about Adam. Uh, that's Adam dying in the bed there. I'm sure you recognized him. Um, and uh, he doesn't have his fig leaf on. And I guess God knows what happened to Eve by then. But um, <laughs> there's Adam with, with Seth, telling Seth that he must record all the knowledge that Adam has. Remember, Adam's the first guy, okay, long before Moses. And, and Adam is telling Seth that he has to go right on a pillar of stone and a pillar of brick, all knowledge that Adam is passing on to his son. So there's Seth dutifully going out the door, wearing a straw hat, God knows. And, um, and so this raises all kinds of questions because if Adam told Seth to go use writing, what did Moses bring down from God on Mount Sinai? Okay, so these are uh, from... Um, um, uh, Purchase his pilgrims, a wonderful compendium of uh, information from uh, multiple, multiple sources. And you'll see these celestial scripts are here. I mean, he has dozens and dozens of these scripts, including down at the bottom of the Chaldean of Abraham, right? So again, we get these mythic tales about these origins of these scripts. Um, and in, uh, in uh, Richard Hallett's Purchase his pilgrims collects 
um, all of these in a systematic way um, next. Um, and these come forward to a book called Pantographia from 1799, one of the great sort of, you know, alphabet resources, compendia, very interesting next, uh, put together by Edmund Fry, a punch cutter and a printer who actually cut punches to make all of these specimens. It took him six years to make all of these. There's Armenia. It's a lot of scholarly labor, scholarly heroes in this book. Oh, this man. And he does us the great favor of citing his sources. You can go to Fournier volume two, page 276 and find what he has copied next. And among the many scripts he copies are these Chaldeans. Okay, check this out. Theseus, so this is where like my research would start, right? Here's Fry. Theseus Ambrosius, who's that? I got to find that book. Assert <laughs> that, the, which I did, of course, but that this character was brought from heaven by the angel Raphael, of course, by whom it was communicated to Adam, who used it in composing songs. He did Adam write the songs after his expulsion from the terrestrial paradise. Some authors pretend that Moses and the prophets used this letter and that they were forbidden to divulge it to mortal men. Dure, page 119. So then you got to figure out who's, who's Dure. Like this is all he gives you is Dure. Okay, got to go find Dure, this is Ambrosius, right? And, and track this down. But these Chaldeans are beautiful next. There's whole bunches of Chaldeans. This is actually Paleo Hebrew. This is a true Paleo Hebrew. But this character is said to have been used by Noah. Spaha, dessert, page 80. So figuring out that Spaha is Spanheim, and this is, it, it took me some time. Okay. Um, there was no map, you know, there's like no roadmap here. Okay, more Chaldeans, we don't need to see those. This, that, wait, go back one, there's one more, Chal this, these are these celestial scripts, um, figures of the stars, these get passed. Oh, there's today, indeed. And it goes on <laughs> and on. Um, so the, 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 these also are considered divine because they were constellations and that the letters came from the stars, right. meant that they were truly divine, right? Right, right, right. Um, next, um, this is a whole story, we'll skip it for the moment, but you can see their celestial scripts. Here are the sources for these celestial scripts and the constellations and the work of Gafferal on the left. And then um, uh, also in the work of Agrippa, Cornelius Agrippa is a great source for passing on all kinds of esoteric knowledge that later is lost. Um, a lot of the libraries that Agrippa was drawing on are destroyed because the monks get a little nervous about things that might be associated with magic. Um, next. Uh, these are various things that are being trans, you know, transmitted. Um, it's too complicated to go into, but various versions of Agrippa, Trithemius, and others. Um, you know, again, where are the medieval sources? Trying to track the Petrus de Bono is a, a, a task many people have put their minds to, and you know, there doesn't seem to be. Yeah, we can keep going next. Um, and this is the. Hold on. At the, Bottom is the, wait a minute. Oh, there it is. The top one is the Ethica Sister alphabet, which shows up in exemplars. You can see it here at the bottom, I'll continue to the second column. So this is this, you know, mythic alphabet has no, it's never used for text. It's not like you can find, you know, extract it from a corpus. There's only the exemplar and it shows up in multiple manuscripts all over Europe. So it's like, how is this happening? Um, you know, Rene de Rolay, the great scholar of runes, does associate it with runic scripts that also are being transmitted in various ways. Um, next, uh, yeah, we won't, we won't deal with Brighton Bath. This is one of the most gorgeous things ever. Um, yeah. This is Edward Bernard, 1689, putting together a systematic study of all the scripts that he can get hold of and putting it on a single engraved plate. Come on, people, in 1689. It's amazing. It's so fantastic. It's a beautiful thing. Um, next. Um, and then, you know, the Athanasius Kircher, of course, isn't going to be left out of the alphabet game. Um, in Turis Babel, he puts his own, you know, sort of list together of all these scripts. And you see the Paleo Hebrew here um, that's also, um, you know, hints of the celestial script. Oh, there's the celestial as well. And so Kircher's compendium, you know, is from 1679. Well, a couple of years later, this guy, Willem Gorey, um, decides, hey, that's pretty cool. I'll put that into my picture, just appropriate it completely, but I'll give it a little narrative. So now we have the, you know, you can see what's going on here. We've got shackles, we've got, you know, um, a biblical setting, we've got an obelisk, you know, we've got a whole story going on. Gorey is fascinating, um, and he has many, many images of, the, of ancient script. 
um, inserted into these vignettes. Next. Um, oh, Mark Wigsbarski. Okay, people, just think about what it means to assemble a table like this. This is in the end of the eighth of the 19th century. Wigsbarski tells you every single source, right? This is for the phonetic um, script. He tells you where the sources like Sidon, you know, what artifact, where it's from, and he copies out the glyphs from those sources in order to compare them to each other, to begin to assemble an understanding of the distribution, modification, and evolution of alphabetic letter forms. It's just fantastic and fantastic. Next. Uh, oh, we don't need to look at Mara Postel. This is a whole story, the Samaritan script. Um, yeah, um, that's fine. That's Samaritan. This is Bernard de Montacon. It is early 18th century. And you can see these um, at the very bottom, you have these little Paleo Hebrew inscriptions. Next. Um, uh, yes, well, Charles Forster, another of my great heroes, The One Primeval Language from 1854, his great big harmony of primeval alphabets. Forster is, in spite of the fact that by the 19th century, people knew more, he was still reading these in terms of biblical tales and histories. Um, and, um, you know, here's the Sinai. This is um, uh, um, uh, Petri's wife, uh, Hilda, uh, Hil uh, I'm getting it wrong. Uh, at the point when they discovered the, she actually, uh, she was the wife of Whit, uh, uh, William Flinders Petrie, the Egyptologist, she's the person who sort of says, hey, uh, come over here. I think we've got some inscriptions to look at next. Mm -hmm. um, and this is the Sphinx they found and so forth. You can see the little alphabetic inscription on it next. And uh, here it is up close next. And, um, you know, here's, uh, we, we will skip this more, these endless things. And here's Unicode um, and the question of, you know, what particular, um, uh, what the relationship between Phoenician and Paleo Hebrew should be. So it doesn't show up on the slide. I think that's it, right? Um, yeah, that's the Unicode. Um, so anyway, let's just give you a quick little little glimpse of some of the pictures. But these this, images are fantastic. These yes, books. it's very good. I'm not used to asking ethnic questions, but I will. <laughs> uh, just curious, where does glagolitic fit into this whole picture? Yeah, glagolitic is one of the modified, you know, versions of um, Slavic scripts, right? And it's Sebastian Kempkin is the great scholar of glagolitic and Church Slavonic, and has tracked, um, you know, the, those uh, scripts and their evolution and and modification. So again, I, um, I, it didn't show, glagolitic didn't show up on there. Yeah, yeah. So um, exactly when and where it emerges, I don't know off the top of my head, but um, there, there, I'm pretty sure that Fry has a glagolitic in his compendium. No, mm -mm. no. right. But again, you know, these forms, you know, sort of, you know, it's, it's, it's like spice, it's like, you know, style, right? It's like it gets, the, the letter forms get transformed and modified um, and become part of, you know, linguistic and cultural environments and stabilized, so. Um, but uh, precisely where wing glagolitic emerged, I'm not sure. My guess is it's, it's, it's kind of, you know, late antiquity and yeah, early medieval. Yeah, that would make sense. But um, yeah, again, Sebastian Kempchen is the person whose work I can send you the reference. He's a fantastic uh, scholar. I think she's done. <laughs> I'm done. Yeah. <laughs> anybody oh. want? Anybody else want to ask a question? No, not yet. You have a question? Yeah, sure. Probably it's there, but I won't need to explain. No, no, sure, Lisa. I'm still not sure between like the Egyptian and Phoenician that connection. I mean, how, oh. you know, from the hieroglyphics, because sure. that map also shows, and you said they're not calling it Phoenician now, but. but well, the Phoenicians didn't call themselves Phoenicians. Yeah. Uh, so how, 
that part if you could clarify i'm sure it's in the book <laughs> no i mean okay so what's really interesting is that writing emerges you know simon basically about the same time in egypt and in the ancient near east about 3700 bce and at that point we get a fairly you know well codified and standard set of signs in egypt and in cuneiform the cuneiform takes a little longer to you know get mature what's interesting about egyptian writing is there's no early there's no there's no baby writing there's no kind of form that's like oh it's going to emerge whereas with the alphabet we see those kind of like crude little forms and stuff um but the idea of writing is crucial to the development of writing and so one of the things that is clear is that as you know because the, the there were many cultural exchanges this is you know areas of trade routes and through the sinai and up through the levant and along the coasts and so forth is that you know semitic speakers saw there was a thing called writing and you know and also because the assyrians are semitic speakers right the semitic language group is huge and egyptians are different branch of the Afroasiatic languages, but the rest are Semitic speakers. So they see this thing called writing um, because it's used it for official purposes, it's used for communication, it's used for record keeping, and in Egypt it's used monumentally. So there were there's documented um, histories of Semites going into Egypt as mercenaries to work in, for instance, the turquoise mines in the Sinai. So this is one of the moments where it's like, oh, these guys have this and we're, you know, like maybe, you know, it's useful for something. So the, the sense of, so, so you can transmit an idea without having to transmit the specific forms. Exactly. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's where that exchange takes place. My limited knowledge, the Phoenician one has more forms, has more, it's very schematic. Schematic. Then yeah, it's the, very schematic. That, that's more picture, you know, epigraphy. Right. Um, but again, it, you know, the, the, the term that's used for talking about the earliest formation of what is the alphabet is proto Canaanite, right? And, and that then gets, you know, sort of consolidated by the time the, the what we call now Phoenician traders are taking that around the Mediterranean, it's 1000 BCE. Right, whereas the earliest alphabetic prototypes that we see are 1700, right, or so. And again, these things that were found in Wadi El Hole by the Darnells are possibly 100 to years earlier, and they're more primitive in their form. So one of the things that the epigraphers and, and paleographers look at is like, how long would it take for this form to modify into that form, for this to spread, for this to happen? You know, it's very similar to stylistic studies in art history or um, sound studies in linguistics, historical linguistics, right? So what, what is the, you know, rate of transformation and change? Um, but by the time the alphabetic script is being circulated by the Phoenician traders or, you know, somehow Greeks are coming into contact with it, it's quite stable. It's, it's really stable. And the forms are elegant and beautiful and you know, you look at, at these Phoenician, these inscriptions, you know, from, you know, 800 BCE, and they are as beautiful and as consistent. It's like, these are not things being written by people who don't know what they're doing. These are skilled scribes who are using a familiar visual form. And again, keep in mind, there are two ways to copy a visual, a, a, a letter form. One is to see it as a shape and have to draw it, and the other is to know the strokes. And so mm -hmm. that displays a whole different level of familiarity when what you're doing is using the strokes. This is body knowledge, right? It's not optical. So that's another kind of telltale sign of how mature the script is. Yeah, it's such interesting stuff. Um, I don't know how much longer we want to go. I'm gonna leave that to- Yeah, not too much more. Srinka. Yeah. But I, I mean, I'm just listening to you talk and kind of, in awe of the, the breadth of the range of this book. And it makes me think about, everybody talks about interdisciplinarity all the time right now um, on our campus. And this book is on the one hand, really about the origins, the, you know, the beginnings of any number of disciplines, but it's also really about 
the limits of mm -hmm. any individual discipline to comprehend yeah. this phenomenon. So I wonder if you could just talk a little bit about, because this is where we began, like you had to right. make up your own field. Um, can you talk about how you understand interdisciplinarity and where you think it should be going? Right. What well, is the future of it in your mind? Sure. I mean, you know, um, the disciplines have their histories, but, you know, they they weren't invented in the first seven days, um, <laughs> <laughs> nor was the blueberry bagel, I will note. Um, so, an abomination. abomination. Exactly. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> so, you know, um, but uh, I mean, you know, for me, it's like I was really interested in writing as the as a visual form. So, what did I? What could I do? I had to borrow from, you know, visual studies, theories of representation, history of writing. You know, it's like all of those different pieces had to come together. And I remember going and talking to a person who will remain unnamed, who was also in in linguistics, and saying, "I wanted, you know, I want to put theories of visual representation together with history of writing together with, you know." sort of historiography. And he said, well, maybe the reason these things never got put together is that they don't belong together. It's like, okay. Um, <laughs> you know, so um, I think, you know, the disciplines have so many different methods and so many different ways of dealing with perception, cognition, knowledge, traditions, and lineages. And, you know, so the synthesis seems really useful mm -hmm. um, in many ways. And again, I was also a practitioner, right? I had already printed I don't even can't remember five or six letterpress books by the time I was going back to study writing. And so for me, the, the visual aspect of writing was so apparent and, and the physical aspect, you know, it's like, how heavy is that word versus that word? So it, it just, you know, um, I was very fortunate to be able to, to do this work at, at that time, though the question of what job would you have, you know, what department would hire you was a big question, but when I, when I was for um, a period of fellowship year at Harvard um, in the fine arts department, which is art history, um, the students were asking everybody in the department, what's your favorite work of art? And I said, the alphabet. And they said, that is not a, that is not a work of art. That is not, a, a, and I was like, what? Wow. Exactly. Wow. So, you know, um, and, uh, yeah, so resistance to, you know, those kinds of things goes on, but that's not my problem. Yeah, uh, but the future of interdisciplinarity, I mean, I think we're seeing, you know, transformations of the disciplines all the time. Um, and, you know, we watched, you know, bears of us watched, for instance, as historians and literary scholars suddenly decided that images were interesting shocking imagine right mm -hmm. or that maps might be something to learn you know so and and yet did not necessarily have the skills of cartographers or the training in art history i mean i'm sorry but you really do need to read panofsky you need to understand that images are are part of a, a field of types that you can't just pick up any image and read it you need to understand how it sits within you know the history of images their form and and so forth so you know, I think it's really important if you're going to do any kind of cross-disciplinary or interdisciplinary work to take seriously what the methods of each discipline actually are and be respectful of the fact that you can't just casually pick up, you know, it's like, oh, no, I'm an art historian because I'm looking at pictures. It's like, you so art, you know? <laughs> yes, absolutely. You know, everybody can read a poem, right? Oh, oh, sure. Exactly. See what so I mean? Easy. Exactly. So well, that was such a wonderful way to kind of finish this discussion, but I also think it really speaks to just the tremendous amount of labor that you years of thinking and labor and familiarizing yourself with all so many different disciplines yeah. that went into the formation of this book. And uh, it's really a gift and Thank also you. was a tremendous, it's such a pleasure to read. It's witty, it is <laughs> so lucid, and I learned so much. And I do think that letters are magical now. I do too. That's the thing. They don't stop being magical right. over the course of the book, which I love. So I just want to thank you for the book. Well, thank you, Helen, for being engaged with it. I really appreciate it. And, you know, I... 
and and I can tell you did your homework. Oh, thank you. <laughs> Which is more than some of the people who wrote reviews. Yeah. <laughs> some of them, I was like, did you read the book? You know? I highly recommend it to you all. I love it. <laughs> so anyway, thanks a lot. And thanks you guys thank for you coming. Guys. That's great.